<laughs> All of us live in a bubble. I don't know whether you know that, but you do live in a bubble. And what we're going to do this morning is talk about our bubble. We'll talk about concern versus influence. We'll talk about speaking up. And we're gonna, I'm going to give you six principles of generosity. I think it might be two o'clock, actually, if I look at that list. <laughs> Question I have for you is how big is your bubble? COVID made our bubbles smaller, shut us down, made us tiny, made us live within a very confined space. Daniel Andrews, 5Ks, that was it. Our bubbles shrunk. But I wonder how big is your bubble? I'm grateful that our bubbles are expanding again. And God wants to make our bubbles so big. Actually, I think God wants to burst our bubbles. He wants to break the confines that we have around us. And he wants us to set us free. Does your bubble limit you and does it limit God? Think about that for a minute. Does the size of your bubble limit you and does it limit God? I think uh, that, that uh, we all have uh, an area of concern and we have an area of influence in our lives. If we think about our bubbles and expanding it, you know, we all have an area of concern. What's happening in Ukraine? What's happening with the war? I wonder how Putin's doing this week. Who's the current Prime Minister in the UK? Who is it this week? <laughs> what will happen with the election uh, in a couple of weeks in this state? Who's going to be uh, controlling us and running us in just a couple of weeks' time? We have a circle of concern, which is broadly. And then if we think about our lives, our families, the people we work with, the people who are our neighbours, the people in our church community, the people that we connect with around our, our worlds, that is our circle of influence. So circle of concern, it's, it's nice to be aware of what's happening globally, but think about our circle of influence. We can't really change the circle of concern. We can't adjust the war, we can pray, but we can't adjust the war in the Ukraine. We can't decide who the next president of the US will be. That's an area of concern. Let's think about being involved and better engaged in our area of influence. Think about those that God has put in our lives that we can influence. <coughs> think about what we're doing uh, uh, to help them. <coughs> Linda uh, walked in this morning. Uh, she's our neighbour. She lives in the unit in front of us. And I knew she was a Christian, but I didn't know she came to this church. Where are you, Linda? You got here? She's somewhere. She was out. She may be doing something out the back. But we seek to help Linda's family. Her mum's Vietnamese. And, and, uh, and uh, she um, hasn't got anyone to cut the lawn at their house. So every, every two or three weeks, I knock on, on her door. And I say, could you open the garage? I need to get your mower out. I've got a couple of things I need to do. And I, I mow the lawn at her house to help her mother. But you know what a mother does? There's a knock on our door a day later, and she's got a beautiful curry or some noodles. <laughs> And it's a blessing. I don't cut the lawn to get the noodles. I cut the lawn to serve Linda's mum. And I actually uh, also have invited Linda's mum to come to church. Oh, no, no, no. I burn incense in the backyard. She's a Buddhist. Let's keep, let's keep thinking about how we can minister to the people who are in our circle of influence. Yes, be, be aware of what's going on outside. But don't worry about what we can't change. I want to tell you about a couple of people. Uh, I was up on this island in the Congo in Ijwe, and we provided water to 18,000 people. They were getting water out of a lake. The lake was toxic. It was wrecking their livers. It, was, uh, it had full of E. coli, and it had sulfur and high mineral content, and they were getting sick with cholera and typhoid from the water. So we went in there with our local partners. We put in some tanks and some pipes, and we got uh, some water stands to 11 different parts of that area. 18,000 people now have access to fresh water. It cost $80,000 for that project. About, uh, my mass is not very good, but about $4 a head to, have, to give people clean water. What a privilege to be able to do that for them. So when they've got clean water, they're not sick. Therefore, they can work. Therefore, they can make more money. Therefore, they can send their kids to the local school. And it dominoes right through the community. By providing clean water, you make available so many resources for, for the poor. 
The other picture is with me. I was in the Philippines about six weeks ago now in a place called Bacolod. Some of you will know where Bacolod is. And I was sitting in this little bamboo hut with Gedalyn. And Gedalyn is a young mum. I think she, by looking at her, she looked about 25. She had six children and was pregnant with number seven. Her, her husband had left and she'd, he'd promised to behave himself and stop beating her, so she let him back in. She then got pregnant with number seven and he decided to leave again. And I said, Gedalyn, how do you survive? She said, well, when my husband's uh, drinking, he, 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 um, he doesn't remember to send money to us. We get about $4 a week sent to us to feed my six children. And our partners are working with Gedalyn in that village. And, uh, and Gedalyn, she said, you know, because of this and because of the partners, I've renewed my faith in God. And God is providing for me. God's providing for my family. The organisation that's helping us is giving me food packs because they're all malnourished. And so Gedalyn is just one example of one person in one village on the back end of one country that we're able to help and share the gospel with and, and uh, see come to the Lord. I don't know what you like with numbers, but, uh, but numbers can, uh, can do me in. Um, I want to talk about some numbers because the Bible, talks, the Bible talks about numbers and it gives us some ideas about what's going on. Do you know that in the Bible, 209 verses that mention the word wisdom? 209. Do you think it might be important that God wants us to have wisdom? There are 175 verses that talk about the poor, 175 verses. There are 111 verses that mention money, 96 verses that talk about the widows and how we're to take care of the widows, 55 verses that talk about the needy, and there are 48 verses that mention the oppressed. Those are just the numbers that we have, the statistically that we have in the Bible and when there's big numbers, we've got to pay attention to it. If God mentions something 111 times or 209 times, do you think maybe that's something that's on his heart that he wants us to be obedient to? This is not going that well for me. Am I doing something wrong with this? Here we go. Is that okay, that's fine. Proverbs 31 verse 8. And this is, uh, this is our key text for today. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. I'm going to read that again because it's powerful. Proverbs 31 verse 8. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. In Proverbs 6, it says something else. There's another, another verse in Proverbs 6. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Because if we're kind to the poor, it's like lending to God. How could we ever lend something to God who has everything? But the Bible says when we are kind to the poor, it's like lending to God and God will reward us for what we have done. Think about that. James 1 verse 22 says this. <clears throat> do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. If we say we're religious and we don't look after our tongue, it's worthless. Boy, that's strong. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. So we just talked about religion. If you, don't talk, if, you, if you can't control your tongue, your religion's worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts, what, what, what honours the heart of God as pure and faultless is this. And here's our instruction. Look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James says that the religion that God looks for is when we look after the widows and the orphans, when we look after them in their distress, 
and we keep ourselves being polluted from the world. What's he telling us to do? To listen to him, to act on what he says, to watch our tongue, to look after the vulnerable and not be polluted by the world. I'm going to talk very briefly, uh, and I'm watching the clock, but I want to share with you very quickly, I could probably preach a sermon on each of these, but what are the six principles of generosity? What are the six principles? We've thought about the world, we've thought about area of concern, area of influence. What is our heart saying? Can we control our tongue? We know about the poor. It's right through Scripture to look after the poor and the vulnerables and the orphans. It's our job as Christians to do that. And so what does it mean when we're generous to help those people? Six core principles. Giving is a heart issue. God is generous. God owns it all. Seek first his kingdom. Heaven, not earth, is my home. And giving brings joy. Those are the six things. I'm going to quickly go through those uh, with you. And we'll have a look at it. Giving is a heart issue. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm sure... You've all heard that verse uh, preached before. Where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. Someone said to me, if you want to see where your heart is, just look at your MasterCard statement. Just run through there and that'll tell you where your heart is. It's very true. Giving is a heart issue. It's an issue of the heart. God has to first capture our hearts. And when he's got our hearts, he's got everything else. If we say, yes, Lord, I'll come on church on Sunday, I'll even have my baby dedicated. But you know what? I really want to live my life my own way. I want to be that vessel that May talked about that maybe has got a, a wonky handle on one side and it's probably the wrong shape. Giving is a heart issue. And when we give God our heart, when we give God everything in our lives, when we give him 100% of who we are, then, then the other stuff will follow through quite easily. Giving is an issue of the heart. How's your heart? Has God got it? Or do you just say he's got it? Do we give it token uh, acknowledgement? Or does God really have our heart? And it goes back to saying, what gets me out of bed on Monday? What is it that drives me? Has God got your heart 100%? He's not interested in 99.9%. He just wants it all. Second thing, our God is a generous God. God is incredibly generous. And we often read this verse and we, 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 forget, we forget this part of it. For God so loved the world that he gave, full stop. God so loved the world. Yes, he gave his only son and it was incredible. But if you put a full stop after that, you say we serve a generous God. For God so loved the world that he gave. Do we so love the world and our communities that we give? And if we give, are we giving sacrificially? God created the earth, created the universe, created us. He had everything he wanted. But when he gave, he gave so generously, he gave the one thing that was most precious to him. He gave his one and only son and sacrificed him so each of us could know forgiveness for our sins and eternal life with him. And if our God so loved the world that he gave, what do you think our response should be to that? Number three is a recognition that God owns it all. Do we really believe that? I deal with some seriously wealthy people I'm going to be having, apparently I'm having dinner with a billionaire in Singapore in a couple, uh, next week. And he's got this private chef, I'm told, it might not happen. But he's got this private chef who's a celebrity chef in Singapore and he's coming to his house and he's going to cook for me. And you can all tell that I actually don't need more food. <laughs> I'm feeding in a very good paddock. My wife's a wonderful cook. But, but, but when we think about God owns it all, the conversation I'm going to have with that multi, he's a multi-billionaire, the conversation I'm hoping to have with that man is to say, what are you going to do with it? How much do you need, actually? How much do you want? He wants to set up a friend of mine in a business. 
He said, I'll give you 300 million startup capital to start a business. My friend said, no, no, I'm not interested. Oh, it's not enough money? We'll make it 400 million then. He goes, no, you're missing the point. He said, I want to help the poor and I want to make an, share the gospel with people. It's not about making more money. And this guy said, how did you get to that conclusion? He's a Christian. He said, could, could, could you introduce me to the people that are mentoring you and telling you this stuff? I want to meet them. I want to find out what makes them tick. Hence the dinner invitation. So God's put me and, and trust in an incredibly unique position. I can sit with Gedalyn in her bamboo hut in Bacolod and share the love of Jesus with her. And, and, and God willing, I can sit with a multi-billionaire in his home in Singapore and challenge him about what he's doing with the resource that God has already given him. And between those two extremes is you and me. We have a house, we have a car, we maybe have a job or a business. We have some capital, we have a superannuation fund, a bit of savings, rainy day money. By the way, it's been raining recently, if you noticed. Time to get rid of the rainy day money. <laughs> <laughs> but when we recognise that God owns it all, it's really, really a significant moment in our lives. Julie and I got to that a number of years ago. We've renovated nine houses. I've been in ministry for 40 years um, and the only way we could get ahead was by renovating houses and we got good at it. <laughs> but recent, a few years ago, seven years ago, God said, I want you to simplify. I want you to get rid of debt. I want you to slow down. Well, I didn't slow down, but I want you to stop chasing money and I want you just to focus on me. So we sold our big house in, in Donvale with a swimming pool and beautiful home. We loved it. And we moved into a, 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 a villa unit behind Linda in East Doncaster. And we're delighted with our little home. And when, we, when I come back from a trip in India or the Philippines or Africa, and I've seen the way people live and I've spent time in people's homes, I come back and say, Lord, you've given us a palace to live in here in, in East Doncaster. Thank you so much. But it's not our home. We happen to have our name on the title, but it's actually God's. It belongs to God. And, and the car that I drive, yes, I just drive this car. It's a 10, 11-year-old car, but it's God's. And the money we have saved and a little bit we have in superannuation, it's not mine. It's not ours. It's God's. And so we have learned to recognise that everything we have is God's. We are simply stewards of it, and we want to be wise stewards. We want to steward it wisely because one day I'm going to stand before God and he's saying, Richard, I didn't give you a billion, but I gave you a million. How did you steward that for me? Did you use it wisely? Did you invest in the poor? Did you help those that cannot help for themselves? Did you share the gospel with it? Did you treat your neighbour? Did you take your wife out for dinner occasionally? Did you buy a nice gift for someone? It's not all just about the poor. It's about ha having a holistic life, but the poor need to be an important part of that. God owns it all. If you can come to that conclusion today and you recognise that and you act on that, I can promise you that God will use that to change your life. God owns it all. Next one is uh, priorities. What are our priorities? The Bible says, seek first, not second or third, seek first the kingdom of God and all the other stuff will be given to you as well. So it's about getting our priorities right. If we seek God's kingdom first and foremost, we put that at the foremost part of our minds, then the Bible and God promises that all the other stuff will be added to us as well. So important that we seek God's kingdom and that we honour him. The next one, the last, uh, two more to go. And these are also so important. Heaven, not earth, is my home. Heaven, not earth, is my home. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul reminds the church in Philippi, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Julie and I had the privilege of being in Turkey 
in July. We did the Seven Churches of Revelation tour with a theologian, and we went through southern and, uh, and western Turkey. And we went to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamon and some of those uh, areas where they wrote to the early church. Uh, and as we think about that, many of the believers were incredibly wealthy in that time. I didn't realize that they were so wealthy. But guess what? They used their wealth to work with Paul to share the gospel to the people that had never heard the message. And it cost them financially. It cost them physically. And, and many of them were pushed out of their wealthy societies because they stood up for the gospel. I realized that when Paul was in, uh, in, I think it was Ephesus, we went to Ephesus. They have a big arena in Ephesus. And uh, Paul was welcome to Ephesus. Come and bring your theology, bring your God, tell us about your God. And there was an openness in that society to hear about God. But there was a stumbling block in Ephesus. Because when Paul preached Jesus Christ and him crucified, he said, you can follow my God, but you have to get rid of all your other ones. <gasps> that was terrible. They were happy to bolt the Lord God onto all of their many gods and ideas that they had. But when, when they said that God, if you follow the God, follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to get rid of all the others. That was the breaking point for them. They couldn't do it. When we recognize that our real home is in heaven, not earth, it changes our attitude to how tightly we hang on to this. When I uh, got my jabs during COVID, I had got jabs so I could travel. Um, I had a friend, well-meaning Christian friend, said, Richard, you do know that now you've had the jabs, you're going to die in five years. Oh, th thanks for that. That's helpful. <laughs> I said, but you know what? I said, I don't care. I said, I'm going to work really hard to make the next five years count for the Lord. Oh, no, no, you misunderstand me. He said, you won't have five years. You'll only have about two and a half, and then your health will start to go downhill, and, and you'll take two and a half years to die. I said, that's helpful, thank you. <laughs> I said, well, on that basis, I'm going to work really hard for the next two and a half years and do as much as I can to grow the kingdom and to, uh, and to share the gospel with those that have never heard. You know what? I don't care about life on earth. I do, but it's, it doesn't hold me. Every time I get in an aircraft, and the year before COVID, I think I was on 52 flights that year. It wasn't fun. It was a definition of insanity, actually. But every time, I just have this little habit, but when the plane's at the beginning of the runway, it's about to take off, I'd say, Lord, I'm in your hands. I'm ready to go if this is my last flight. It's good. Take me. I'm ready. I'm quite comfortable. Look after Julie if she's not on the flight with me. Look after Julie. But I hold it very lightly. Because I recognize that this is just an apprenticeship for the real job that God has for us in heaven. To serve him and to honor him. Heaven, not earth, is my home. And the final one is something that I have experienced over and over and over again. That when we give, it brings so much joy in our lives. And I'm not just talking about money. Please don't get me wrong. I'm talking about our time. I'm talking about our talent. I'm talking about serving somebody with a practical help, taking some food to someone, going to visit them, inviting them out for a coffee, taking one of these young couples who have just had a baby, arranging a babysitter and saying, we'd love to take you out for dinner and treat you away from your kid so you can have a normal life again. Little things, giving to people, yes, it's about money as well, but it's not just about money. Money's just an indicator. A lot of my, the most precious commodity I have is actually not money. It's my time. And I try to steward my time very well. My wife will tell you I fail on a regular basis. I take on too much. I don't always do what I should do. But uh, giving brings joy. And if you want joy in your life, if you want to stop looking inward, look outward. If you want to think, oh, woe is me, I don't have this and I don't have that and I can't have this and I can't go there, think about what you do have and then ask, how can I help use that to encourage someone else? How can I give back and bless others? And giving will bring you joy in your life. There is no question about that. How do we respond to God's Word this morning? There are four things that I suggest we could do. Do you want to burst out of your bubble? 
Do you want to break free from the confines that we've wrapped around ourselves? The second thing we could do is how do we want to use our influence that we've maybe taken for granted? How can we use our influence to grow the kingdom and to help others? Maybe God's challenged us and said, I need to speak up for the poor more. I need to grow my heart for the poorest and do something about helping them to obey the 200 scriptures that talk about the poor. And maybe I need to think about my generosity. Could I invite you to stand, please? I'm just going to ask you to stand with me. I'm going to invite you just to bow your heads and just to pray and say, Lord, which of these things are you speaking to me about? It may be what May said earlier about about taking that clay vessel and breaking it down and starting afresh. Just bow your heads and close your eyes and say, Lord, what is it? What's the one thing that you want me to take away from from this message and this service today? If the Lord's spoken to you about something specific, I'd invite you just to put your hand up and just to acknowledge that God has touched your heart about something. And when we acknowledge that God has spoken to us, it helps anchor it within our lives. If God has spoken to you about something, just pop your hand up and I will pray for you. And I would also invite you to come to the prayer team after the service, share with them what God has spoken to you about and let them pray with you as well. If we fail to listen to God's Word and we fail to act, after a while, we fail to listen. We stop being able to listen. And when God touches our hearts and opens our hearts and we listen and we acknowledge that and we do something about it, I believe that God will honour that in your life and it'll give you something to focus on and something to seek Him for in the days ahead. Thank you for those who have raised their hand. Let me pray for you as we, uh, as we continue and wrap up our service. Lord God, I pray for each of those who have uh, raised their hand and responded to the message that you've given us this morning. Lord, you know what's on their heart. We pray for them. We pray that you'll strengthen them in their inner being. We pray that you'll honour them by engaging with them and helping them to do what it is you've spoken to them about. Lord, I just pray for this church. I thank you for this place. I thank you for the culture and the environment that there is here so that you can work and you can speak to our hearts and speak to our lives. And Lord, we want to glorify and we want to honour you with with our hearts, with our lips, with our words, with our tongue. And may you get the glory and may you get the praise for all that takes place. And Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and receive all the glory and the honour for that we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Richard. It's uh, really an honour for you, for us to hear you speak. Oh my goodness. Um, 